Hello kids, welcome to our work on the presidents. So as usual, I'm going to go through all the ones that we've covered so far. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, first time. Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland second time, and William McKinley. All right, so very excited today, kids. Uh, so presidents 26 through 30, this is when things really, really start heating up. This is really the moment when we get to uh, a United States that is starting to look much more recognizable. Uh, this is the first moment. The second moment is probably after World War II when Truman really builds up the government and government spending takes on a, a life of its own. But this is the first moment. And what we have here is a country coming into its own. We're going to be covering Presidents Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Warren G. Harding, and Calvin Coolidge. This takes us for a total of about 20, 29, 28 years of U.S. history 1901 to 1920, 1929. So we are in the midst of the second industrial revolution, also known as the technological revolution. This means that um, the rise of technology is happening more quickly and at a faster, it's happening at a faster rate and you're getting more technologies building on other new technologies. This is the time when you get uh, the, the radio, uh, railroads are well in place at this point. Uh, the car is coming to be a thing. So you've got uh, move, people moving now, not just at the speed of a horse. And that is a very, very interesting shift. And we are still dealing with that shift today. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on. There had been women's suffrage movements happening uh, since the mid-19th century. Women's suffrage is uh, the movements to get the right to vote for women. This was happen happening globally. Uh, women's suffrage in America uh, during this time in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified to give women in the United States the right to vote. Uh, this was also the period of the Roaring Twenties, right? But we have to get there first because there's a lot going on before then. And the most important thing going on before then politically, uh, globally, is World War I, which happens 1914 and 1918. Very interesting story there. There's a lot more to talk about. We could talk about architecture, the rise of the Bauhaus School of Architecture, Mies van der Rohe, for example, very famous architect. Uh, we could talk about the rise of skyscrapers. The first skyscraper may have been the home insurance building in Chicago built in 1885. And a skyscraper back then was defined as a building over 10 stories tall. And that one, I believe, was 138, 139 feet tall. So you buildings are starting to go up, right? This is also the era, I believe, of the, uh, I think, well, we're past the Great Chicago Fire, and now we're, we're starting to get more buildings made of steel. Uh, we've got steel reinforcements. We've got uh, neo-classical uh, architecture coming, in addition to the Bauhaus School, which is sort of this function and beauty combination thing with Mies van der Rohe. There's just a lot of stuff going on. So without further ado, I'm going to start with Theodore Roosevelt, who is a Republican. He is a larger-than-life figure. There are many stories about him that uh, I could share, but <laughs> there's just so many 
Uh, all right, so he was born into the Roosevelt family, one of the wealthiest and most prominent families in New York. The family was originally Democratic in its leanings, but changed to Republican during the Civil War. Roosevelt's father was wealthy and a noted philanthropist who helped found the Metropolitan Art Museum and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. As a child, Roosevelt had asthma, but he overcame this problem with the restless energy which would define his personality for the rest of his life. That's true. Roosevelt was an adventurer. He was the kind of guy that just loved to go do things. He was what was called a mugwump Republican. These, who, these were Republicans who wanted to clean up corruption. He was also a vocal supporter of the Spanish-American War. When the war broke out, he joined the Army and formed his own regiment called the Rough Riders. After the war, he ran as McKinley's vice president. He became the youngest president to hold office after McKinley was assassinated. So here you have our friend Roosevelt background. So in office, Roosevelt would be the first president, president to be part of a movement called the Progressive Era. Progressivism grew out of the emerging middle class who felt torn between the business elites and the rural farmers. Progressives wanted better education, better living standards, and an end to corporate monopolies. Remember, the last president's video, I discussed how this was known as the Gilded Age. We had the rise of these monopolies like Standard Oil, you know, people like Roosevelt, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, others who are sort of have a stranglehold on these industries, and people want to end this, okay? Roosevelt catered to the progressives by basing his presidency on what he called the Square Deal. The Square Deal was a plan with three agendas, to conserve the country's natural resources, to control big business, and to protect consumers. Roosevelt went after large corporations, trusts, and got a reputation as a trust buster. So Roosevelt is looking out for the little guy in his domestic policy, and let's be clear, domestic policy is, how, is what a president is doing at home within the borders of the country. His foreign policy, that's right, Roosevelt's motto for his foreign policy was to speak softly and carry a big stick. This meant that his policy was not to be aggressive in the world, but to have a large enough military to deal with conflicts if need be. His primary accomplishment in foreign policy was to help negotiate a treaty to end the Russo-Japanese War, he would later win the Nobel Peace Prize for this accomplishment. Roosevelt also acquired the rights to build the Panama Canal during his presidency. Very, very nice there. And uh, he was a very popular guy, um, Theodore Roosevelt. Very, very popular, uh, popular figure. Um, the interesting thing with the foreign policy, the, the Russo-Japanese War was one of those first uh, sort of modern wars. And a lot of uh, people say that uh, uh, people who did their research and studied that war uh, really had uh, a leg up in World War I, or the Great War, it was called, when uh, uh, things got really mechanized with barbed wire and machine guns, etc. So let's look at Theodore Roosevelt fun facts. If ever there was a president who possessed all the glamour of our national identity, it was Teddy Roosevelt. As a British writer observed after visiting the White House in 1903, Roosevelt is not an American, you know, he is America. Okay, so he's a larger-than-life figure, faces every ob obstacle head-on. Okay, I could go on and on. Okay. He became the youngest president. He was known as the Trust Buster. He was resoundingly elected in 1904. Remember, he was the vice president for McKinley when McKinley was assassinated. And always on the side of the little guy. He endorsed the Pure Food and Drug Act, as well as the Elkins Act, aimed at railroad corruption. And he doubled the number of national parks and increased America's forest reserve by 150 million acres. In 1906, he bought Panama. And there you have it. So Theodore Roosevelt, very, very popular president. And, of course, he is one of the figures on Mount Rushmore today. All right. So let's talk about William Taft who was president from 1909 to 1913. Roosevelt is 1901 to 1909. So Taft was born into a politically prominent family. His father was Secretary of War in the Grant administration, and he followed in his father's political footsteps. When he was 32, he became the youngest person to be appointed as the Solicitor General of the United States. That person represents the federal government in Supreme Court cases. 
During McKinley's administration, he became the first governor general of the Philippines. Taft did not want to be president, and he always asserted that he wanted to be a Supreme Court justice. However, he was the most prominent member of Roosevelt's cabinet, which made him the natural candidate to run. He re reluctantly agreed to run for the sake of the Republican Party and won. So we have a reluctant president. Very similar to someone like Ulysses S. Grant, who was a much better general than he was a president. As president, Taft had a different style compared to Roosevelt. He still believed in Roosevelt's agenda to tame big business, but he did not forcibly argue his beliefs. He preferred to approach problems as legal issues that needed to be resolved. Despite his style, Taft in many ways was a greater proponent of the progressive agenda than Roosevelt. His administration broke up more monopolies than Roosevelt's did. His administration broke apart the massive Standard Oil Company, which made John D. Rockefeller the richest man in history. He also broke apart U.S. Steel, the largest corporation in America. Taft also oversaw the establishment of federal income and corporate taxes. For this to happen, Congress had to pass the 16th Amendment. So now we have federal income and corporate taxes under President Taft. So the country is getting much more um, infrastructure, and we are becoming much more like we are today. So I love this picture. This is him tackling. Look at that. This, uh, very cool. Oh, that's Standard Oil. Yeah, going after these guys, Standard Oil. All right, foreign policy. Taft preferred a foreign policy that used America's economic power as its strength. This is called the dollar diplomacy approach to foreign affairs. This means giving foreign countries loans in exchange for supporting U.S. policy. This also helped in improving trade with other nations. Okay, so there you have it. Strength, you, easy, America's economic power as strength. Okay, giving loans in support for US, supporting U.S. policies. So let's read about William Howard Taft. He was born into Cincinnati, graduated second in his class from Yale, practiced law in Cincinnati. He was a Superior Court judge, 1887, running over the Philippines. He was Roosevelt's most trusted troubleshooter. <laughs> this is interesting. So there was a, it seems like a falling out with him and uh, Roosevelt later over something going on here. And it looks like in 1912, Roosevelt challenges Taft for the Republican nomination, but Taft gets it. Roosevelt founded the Bull Moose Party so he could run its ticket and split the Republican vote. And what happened was that because of this, the Democrat Woodrow Wilson won. So it looked like there was some sort of schism between Taft and Roosevelt, who came back and wanted to win the presidency as part of the Bull Moose Party. Really, really interesting. Also, in 1921, Taft was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And in that role, he swore in uh, Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover successively into office. Yeah, he is actually more known for being a Supreme Court uh, justice than he is for being president. Very interesting. All right, let's talk about Woodrow Wilson, President 28, who was president from 1913 to 1921. Okay. Woodrow Wilson grew up in the South. His parents supported the Confederacy during the Civil War and owned slaves. His father was a theologian who taught at various universities. When his father taught at Princeton University, he became a student there. He later would become president of the university. He used his popularity as an educator in New Jersey to be elected governor there in 1910. The Democratic Party at the time was desperate for good candidates, uncorrupted by the party system, and Wilson fit the bill. As governor, he pursued the progressive agenda. In the presidential election of 1912, the Democrats chose him to run against Roosevelt and Taft, who were also progressives. Wilson won, mainly due to the fact that Roosevelt and Taft split the Republican vote. <laughs> yeah, what I was just saying. So, looks like at the bottom here you have Taft 
uh, and Roosevelt fighting, which gives our friend Woodrow Wilson the presidency. So domestic policy. Wilson got elected on his, quote, new freedom, unquote, platform. He tried to appeal to progressives and the farmers who were the traditional base of the Democratic Party. These policies promoted less economic protectionism by lowering tariffs, but also promoted breaking up the monopolies that were destructive to business. He also established the Federal Reserve System to keep banks from taking risks with the public's money. He pursued many of their pro-labor policies that were demanding attention. Under Wilson, worker compensation was given to federal workers, and the eight-hour workday was established for railroad workers. We often take for granted some of the things like an eight-hour workday, for example, uh, you know, labor laws, we take those for granted, but we are in the time now when all of these things are being established in the United States to protect workers. So this is a really, really important time uh, for the Democrats and the Republicans to be uh, making changes to look out for the regular people. So it's going to take a while, but uh, we would eventually get more protections for workers moving forward with the establishments of labor unions, etc. Foreign policy, this is hugely important. In 1914, World War I, the Great War, broke out in Europe. At first, Wilson remained a neutral as the war was largely seen as a European affair. However, when Germany sank uh, the Lusitania, a British ship, and killed 129 Americans on board, this began tipping Americans in favor of the war. Wilson ran for re-election as a peace candidate and won, but he always maintained that he would not tolerate tax on Amer attacks on American citizens. In 1917, a telegram was intercepted, which tried to recruit Mexico to fight with Germany against the United States. This event provoked Wilson and Congress to declare war against Germany. After the war, Wilson tried to establish the League of Nations so that conflicts could be resolved peaceably between nations. Wilson could not get Congress to agree to join the League. So World War I. One of the most important events in modern, I guess you could say, contemporary history. Uh, World War I did not at first involve the Americans. We got involved because we saw their, our, our interests at stake. We at this time, though, were providing uh, for many of the belligerents in the war, uh, especially Great Britain. And the interesting thing is America is getting rich during this war because it's turning out that modern war with machine guns, tanks, trench warfare is a lot more expensive. Okay, war has become way more expensive. The logistics of moving and keeping troops fed uh, is just, and the number of troops going into battle. I mean, some of these World War I battles are lasting, you know, weeks and months, right? Like you've got uh, the stories about what's going on with some of these, these battles, the Battle of the Marne. Uh, the battles for the front. I mean, there's so many different things going on here that you really get a, a revolution in, in how wars are fought. And the United States is getting rich off of the countries that are fighting in this war. They join the war very, very late and don't really get involved that much. The interesting thing is there is another country that's involved here that goes through a revolution at the time. This is Russia. Russia goes through... Um, the what's called the October Revolution, Red October 1917, and gets the rise of a, of, of a, a party called the Bolshevik Party that are pushing a variant of socialism, which would become the known, be known as communism, led by Vladimir Lenin, and it goes through a revolution during this time. <laughs> and this new, you know, Soviet Union of Socialist Republics um, would be incredibly important moving forward. So you had a lot of things going on here. This was a truly global war. Uh, the main belligerents, of course, uh, Germany. And this is not the Germany of Hitler. This is Kaiser Wilhelm. This is uh, the Germans considered the bad guys. Uh, but in this war, Hitler is actually only a corporal in the military. And his experiences would of course, shape him moving forward. I could go on, but I won't. There's a lot more to say about World War I. All right, Woodrow Wilson, revered for his leadership during World War I. He was one of the best educated presidents. 
Yeah, the Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat. He said, the world must be made safe for democracy, with his famous quote. 1919, the Versailles Treaty ending World War One. All right, Woodrow Wilson, president during World War I, president from 1913 to 1921. Let's talk about Warren G. Harding, one of uh, Roosevelt's, or I'm sorry, Wilson's opponents. He's a Republican. So Warren G. Harding started his career in the newspaper business in Marion, Ohio. As a young man, he bought the Marion Daily Star with some investors. Being in the newspaper business, he naturally became involved in politics. He favored Republicans, which brought him into conflict with the Democratic leaders running the country. As a senator, Harding was known as a fence center, sitter, someone who doesn't, he's sort of like in between, who took, takes no strong stances on major issues. He generally spent his time building relationships in the Republican Party. By 1920, Harding was known as a solid party man who did what he was told. When the Republican National Convention was held to nominate the next presidential candidate, the Republican Party bosses got together and decided to go with Harding as a moderate candidate. So it sounds like he's just a moderate guy somewhere in the middle. Harding's presidency was plagued with corruption and scandal. He rewarded men who supported him for election with high positions. Most notable of these men were called the Ohio Gang, Harding's Republican Party friends from Ohio. Some of these men got involved in corruption scandals. The biggest one was the Teapot Dome scandal. The Secretary of the Interior had accepted bribes to allow oil companies to drill on public lands at a place called Teapot Dome in Wyoming. Despite the scandal, Harding wanted to run for a second term. However, he died three years into his presidency due to heart problems. Teapot Dome scandal. Harding also had to deal with the issue of whether U.S. would join the League of Nations. Although it was proposed by Wilson, Congress did not want U.S. foreign policy determined by a foreign committee. The U.S. did not sign the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I because it required it to join the League of Nations. Hardy signed separate treaties to make peace with Germany and Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So Wilson dies, never gets to see the League of Nations come to fruition. Of course, this would later be um, a new movement known as the United Nations. So let's talk about Warren Harding. Just raised in small town Ohio. Yep. All right. Let's move on to Calvin Coolidge, who was president during the period we call the Roaring Twenties. Uh, remember, World War I ends and the country gets back to business and the 1920s was a time of incredible economic prosperity and growth and a time of uh, just uh, pushing of boundaries, especially with respect to the flapper phenomenon among women. Uh, and just a, really a much more modern twist. You get, um, you with the radio, you get what is starting to look much more like contemporary America today. So Calvin Coolidge, our 30th president, is president from 1923 to 1929. So he is, yeah, our 30th president. And Warren G. Harding had been president from 1921 to 1923. So in 1912... Coolidge became a senator in the State House of Massachusetts. During this time, a massive strike broke out at the Lawrence Mills, and it was getting violent. Coolidge served on the committee who helped negotiate a resolution to the strike. So he's a peacemaker there. He disliked the strikers and personally thought they were anarchists and communists, but he did negotiate a raise for the workers to end the strike. And in 1919, he had to deal with another strike, this time as the governor of Massachusetts. The Boston police strike occurred after police officers tried to form a union and the commissioner suspended the union leaders. Boston became a lawless city and the National Guard had to be sent in to restore order. In response to the strike, Coolidge had all the strikers fired from their jobs and replaced. So you really get into uh, 
people really advocating for their rights as workers with the formation of unions. And this is an incredibly big deal because we have different presidents with different agendas with how they're going to deal with this. Coolidge here looks like he's doing somewhere in the middle, but he's also um, certainly didn't help with the Boston police strike there. Coolidge won the presidency in 1924. It says 1924. Oh, that's right. He didn't run. That's right. He took over for Harding because Harding died. Coolidge won the presidency in 1924 as the economy was doing very well at the time. This period of economic boom is known as the Roaring Twenties. The mass production of automobiles and home appliances created, new modern, created a new modern way of life. Mass media changed the culture through radio and movies. Cities swelled with jobs and giant skyscrapers were built to hold all the new workers. Wages were rising and the stock market tripled by the end of the decade. Coolidge was an unapologetically pro-business president. He once said, the chief business of the American people is business. He disliked government regulating businesses, and so he appointed people to regulations agencies who would not do their jobs. So he was a big pro-business guy. The 1920s under uh, Coolidge was an incredible a time of incredible economic growth. As I have said before, and as you see on the card here, radio, movies, skyscrapers, rising wages, stock market growing, lots of stuff going on there during the Roaring Twenties. Foreign policy. Coolidge rejected Wilson's idea of the League of Nations. He was willing to join the World Court, which was part of the League of Nations. This could be a court where countries could settle their disputes. However, the U.S. did not join until after World War II, when it was part of the United Nations. Coolidge signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact instead. This treaty was a pact to renounce war between nations. So Coolidge wants to stay out of war. Now, Coolidge is a very interesting character. He actually has my favorite quote by any president uh, ever. And it, this, is, this is one of my favorite quotes. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. So, very famous quote that I really enjoy by Calvin Coolidge there on or persistence and perseverance. So, this was, wow, a lot of stuff going on here. I talked about women's suffrage. I did also want to mention the 18th Amendment. So, let's, let's go back. So, 18th Amendment, prohibition, basically making buying and selling alcohol illegal. Volstead Act, built on this 18th Amendment, which lasted from 1920 to 1933. This is known as prohibition, the, the Prohibition Era. And this, of course, gives rise to the bootlegging industries, uh, all of the black markets underneath, and of course, you know, all the... Al Capones of the world, crime bosses who are making money uh, in this time during Prohibition. So uh, Chicago, of course, is very famous for this. Infamous, I guess you could say. And it was repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933. Interesting fact there that the 21st Amendment is the only amendment specifically designed to repeal an amendment. So this was the time of the 18th Amendment leading into Prohibition. It was also the time of women's suffrage. I talked about this earlier. The 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, passed in 1919, made law in 1920. This was also the time architecturally of the rise of skyscrapers and new architecture based on function. Uh, this was economically a time of great growth, but also a time of the fraught rights of workers who are struggling to find their place and gain their rights as the common person working in a world of business where there's not a lot of regulations for how long someone is to work, what are they going to get paid. So this is a time that is, it's, it's, it's kind of fraught right now. So there's, there's a lot, there's a mixed bag. So the Roaring Twenties we talked about, we talked about Theodore Roosevelt, his popularity, 
going into the century. Woodrow Wilson leading the people through the Great War. By the way, World War One never did, was not known as World War One until there was a well, World War Two. It was known as the Great War, in fact, at that time. We just now refer to it as World War One. So, and then we got Warren G. Harding, and finally Calvin Coolidge here. So we've covered a lot of material here. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I know I have. Uh, this era is, is actually a really interesting time for me. Uh, I, I'm not a historian of the United States, but the 1920s, people have argued, is really what made modern America. Uh, the, the America that emerged after the 1920s and into the 30s and going into World War II was completely different than what came before. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Have a great day.